Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Washington Bike Walk Roll Summit presented by Amazon. We'll give folks a couple minutes to get into the call, get settled, but we're happy to see you here today for this keynote session with Anna Zivarts. Um, as you get comfortable, feel free to put your name, where you're at into the chat bar so we can see where people are joining us from. And again, excited to have you all here. All right, we'll get started. So, hi everyone. I'm Tamar. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the community organizer at Cascade Bicycle Club. Welcome to the Washington Bike Walk and Roll Summit presented by Amazon. We're, pre we're excited to have over 600 registrants for this virtual five day event. And we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. The summit is virtual and those participating are joining us from many lands. We acknowledge that the land that Cascade Bicycle Club sits on today is the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. If you don't know whose land you're on, you can take a look in the chat in a few minutes. I'll put a link to a map where you can find your place on the land. Without these tribal nations, we would not have access to this environment, and we take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. We'd also like to note that we are recording this session and it will be available following the summit. The summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and ability throughout Washington State, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride and holding rides and events. Washington Bikes advocates for bicyclist rights, endorses political candidates, holds officials accountable, and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. We also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, whose collective contributions have enabled us to bring together 15 panels of expert speakers with registration free for all attendees. Thanks to Amazon, our presenting sponsor. We also wanna thank our supporting sponsors, the Washington State Department of Transportation, Active Transportation Division, and Eastern Washington Region, as well as our general sponsors, the US Department of Transportation, Federal Highway Administration, and Stacey Bain, Bike Lawyer. With that, and before we transition into introducing this summit session, we'd like to take a moment to articulate the community expectations we have for all summit sessions. We will maintain a standard of conduct to ensure that all participants feel safe and respected. We believe that every person has the right to be treated with dignity and respect and to be free from all forms of harassment. We ask that you be fully present in this session, be self-responsible and self-challenging, listen and process, suspend judgment of yourself and others, and use respectful language towards each other and the panel. Also, if you have any questions or concerns during the session, feel free to reach out to our chat monitors through the personal message feature of the chat bar. Now, I'm really honored to introduce our keynote session and our keynote speaker, Anna Zivarts. Anna Zivarts is the director of the Disability Mobility Initiative Program at Disability Rights Washington, which is a nonprofit that protects the rights of people with disabilities across Washington state. This keynote session will address a really important conversation around what it means to be a white advocate in active transportation. And Anna will also speak to her personal experiences and growth, as well as to what her journey as a disabled advocate has been. This address will also discuss the importance of accessible transportation for communities around Washington and beyond. The format of this presentation will be this 10 minutes of introduction period, then we'll have about 30 to 40 minutes of keynote presentation from Anna, and the rest of the time will be open to audience Q&A. As Anna goes through her presentation, attendees are encouraged to ask questions via the chat bar at the bottom of your screen, and those will be directed to Anna during that open Q&A session. Additionally, we really appreciate your feedback, and at the end of the session, we'll be providing a feedback form uh, for you to fill out, which will also be in the chat bar. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'll send it over to Anna. Thank you all for being here and thank you, Anna, especially. Hi, thanks. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this. I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen now. Let's see, there we go. All right, I'm hoping that's working. <laughs> um, 
So yes, my name is Anna Zivarts, and I'm the program director of the Disability Mobility Initiative, uh, which is a new program at Disability Rights Washington uh, that launched this fall. And on this slide, um, there are three uh, URLs. I'm uh, hoping someone um, from Cascade is also going to paste them into the, the chat box. One is for a transcript of this presentation. There's also a link to the slide deck in case you want to download it yourself. And then the third is a YouTube playlist. I'm going to play a couple of videos, uh, but there's a lot of videos that I talk about um, but don't want to take the time to play during this presentation. So uh, as you are looking for something to distract you later today, you can check those out. Um, I really encourage you to do that. So I'm actually going to do another land acknowledgement um, since I'm based here in Seattle and I'm on Duwamish land. Um, and I'm going to do that in the form of a video. Okay, after this car, we'll go to the center. Okay. Now we have to wait here in the middle. There's about five more cars coming. Oh, bless you. They rarely stop. My name is Iwani Casey, and I'm an enrolled tribal member of the Tlingit Nation Raven Frog Clan. The Duwamish Tribal Longhouse opened in 2009, and we've been trying to get a crosswalk with a light and also a bus stop since then. We've been talking about it actually even before the Longhouse opened. And this is where the street is, has a blind corner and the cars go very, very rapidly. Here's some more cars coming really fast around the corner. If we were to go, you never know if there's gonna be a car coming from around the corner very rapidly. And there is one there, and there's more coming from the other direction. And this is on a Sunday. Can you imagine what it would be during a work day? So I visualize a crosswalk can be either on this side or that side of the street with a light, with a push button, with a light so that it will shut down. And the crosswalk needs to be marked in fluorescent uh, paint so that at night you can see it and then the light needs to be flashing above it. And then the bus stop, you could be at that where that that sign is here and also on the other side. The traffic has increased significantly since the closure of the West Seattle Freeway Bridge. We really need to have a safe crosswalk with the lights and a bus stop on both sides. One of the questions I think about a lot is who has the ability to move our, around our communities reliably without fear? As you can see in this video, here is a cultural institution for the people whose land we are on that can't be accessed by sidewalks or by the bus. It's a terrible and powerful example of how and where we build and don't build infrastructure and whose mobility matters to the people deciding these things. This is a photo of me uh, learning to ride my bike along the rural suburbanish road that I grew up on in Olympia. Cars went so fast along here that our elderly neighbor uh, couldn't cross the street safely to get her mail. And so I remember as a kid bringing her her mail every day because the mailbox was on our side of the street. So much of our state and our country isn't designed for people who can't drive or don't have access to a car. Uh, as someone who was born with an eye condition that makes it impossible for me to get a driver's license, this is something that I think about a lot. After college, I moved to New York City, uh, where the subway ran 24 seven and most people didn't have cars. I wanted to fit in. I didn't want my disability and lack of access to car mobility to be the defining feature that shaped my life. Because of the cost of living in New York, I ended up living um, in a neighborhood that didn't have close subway access. And so I started biking a lot for transportation and that's how I became uh, involved in pedestrian and biking advocacy, uh, in particular around traffic violence. This is a photo I took from a vigil for Allison Lau. Um, she was a preschooler who was crossing the street with her grandmother and was killed by a, a turning car. 
Um, Allison's family members became uh, leaders in the Families for, Straits, Families for Safe Streets advocacy organization in New York. Um, but even in New York, you can see where most people don't have cars, crashes kill a lot of people. Um, last year, 124 pedestrians there were killed by cars. My day job, however, was doing video for uh, social justice organizations, mostly service worker labor unions. Um, this is a photo of me filming a rally in New York. And through this work, I got to travel the country. Usually I would fly into a small airport, get a hotel shuttle to a strip mall hotel, and then the next day the client would pick me up uh, for the video shoot. Uh, but I'd have the evenings to myself and I would try to go out and find a local place to eat. This is a, a photo of my shadow walking along the, the highway in Orlando. There's really great um, Brazilian food in Orlando, but you have to try to escape the, the hotel strip to get there. Um, through this travel, I got the experience to experience a lot of places in America. I believe this is a photo from Ohio. And this is Huntington Beach. Um, you can see that the grass is all worn down along the, the side of the, the road here where people, aside from me, lots of people are walking. It was an odd combination of the privilege of jetting around the country to film, um, but when I got somewhere, I was a pedestrian in environments where only the poor and disabled and often brown or black would be walking. The auto dependence of America felt overwhelming. And whenever I returned to New York, I knew that I was lucky to live in a place where I, as a non-driver, could participate fully in my community. This travel helped me understand that mobility access is so much bigger than pedestrian or cyclist deaths caused by reckless driving. It is interwoven with the way we build our communities and whose mobility we choose to prioritize. Then my son was born and shortly after that was diagnosed with the same eye condition I have. And this is a photo of him sleeping in my lap as an infant. It was a shock for me because I was, had been always told that it wasn't a genetic condition that caused my disability. And suddenly I was confronted with my own internal ableism and the pain and shame of my childhood and trying to pretend that I was normal and could see things that I couldn't. I started to look for ways to connect to the disability community and to begin to heal. And that's how I ended up back in Washington State, uh, working for Disability Rights Washington, leading a team of disabled video producers. Uh, this opportunity to come back to Washington where both my husband and I grew up meant uh, having the support of the family we didn't have in New York, but it also meant coming back to a place where most people own cars and use them to get around on a daily basis. It meant going from a city where everyone assumed you'd be arriving in the subway to a city, still one of the most transit friendly in the nation, where I'd be the only person not dry arriving at most gatherings by car. Oops, I'm going the wrong way here. There we go. This is a photo of, of me and my, uh, my son uh, walking to the bus. At Disability Rights Washington, uh, we survey disabled people in our state. And as we do that, we find that consistently, transportation access is ranked as one of the top three barriers disabled people face to living the lives in our communities that we want to live. Other data backs this up. We know that Black, Indigenous, and people of color, immigrants, poor people, elderly, and disabled people are much less likely to have a driver's license or access to cars. We are also more likely to be transit reliant and more likely to walk or roll for transportation. Our communities have been designed around the automobile. And for those of us who cannot drive or cannot afford to drive, this creates major barriers to, for us to access schools, jobs, doctor's appointments, grocery stores, religious services, and everything else we need to do in order to participate fully in our communities. We also know that a quarter of the people in our state don't have driver's licenses. A quarter of the people, that's a lot. This percentage of people who, who don't and can't drive in our state is probably even larger because many people who uh, have driver's licenses don't have reliable access to a car or have reached an age or have a medical condition where they no longer feel safe driving. And yet, our transportation system is entirely organized around cars. You can get anywhere you need to go in a car in Washington. That definitely isn't true for walking, rolling, biking, or transit, or even a combination of those modes. To combat the narrative that everyone just drives, we create a series of videos featuring people who rely on transit from around the state. This is a still from a video fe featuring Crystal, who's an activist in Tacoma boarding a Pierce Transit bus. And earlier, there was a still of Amandeep, who's a, a white cane user who lives in Snohomish County. 
These were filmed in response to Tim Iman's I-976, uh, but we are going to continue this, uh, to do the same work this year as we fight to preserve transit funding and push the legislature to come up with progressive sustainable revenue sources outside of the gas tax. Our goal is to organize a broad coalition of people who lack access to cars from communities throughout Washington state. We are committed to bringing attention to how people get to and from transit and around our communities. Our organizing and our stories will begin to shift the narrative that only drivers in Washington have mobility needs worth prioritizing. A piece of transportation access that often gets overlooked is how people without cars access transit. For example, 80% of Sound Transit customers arrive on transit, only 20% in cars, and yet we spend $100,000 to build a single parking spot in a Sound Transit garage, at the same time that we can't build duplicate elevators at the Mount Baker station. If you check out the playlist, uh, one of the videos in there is, is uh, folks who rely on Sound Transit, uh, who, who need elevators and escalators, talking about what happens when they're out of service, which as you can see from this graph from Sound Transit from August, isn't that uncommon. This brings us back to the question, whose mobility matters? How do you get safely to your bus stop if your neighborhood is missing sidewalks or if they don't exist? They're in terrible, or, or, if, or if they do exist, they're in terrible disrepair. Sidewalks get covered in bushes, leaves. The street lighting is designed for the roadway, but not for the sidewalk. How do we bring attention to the fact that sidewalks are critical parts of our transportation network? So they need to be cleared of snow and ice, not blocked by shared scooters or street cafes. This is an image from a Seattle City Council campaign for better snow removal. After the epic snows of 2019, we advocated to have Seattle include more education to property owners about their responsibilities for snow removal. Sidewalks are legally part of the public right of way, just like our roads, but we've chosen to make property owners responsible instead of local cities or counties. Imagine what our roads would look like if we had individual property owners decide whether or not they wanted to block them with trash cans, decide whether or not they wanted to clear the snow, decide whether to repair potholes. This is a screenshot of a tweet from AOC uh, sharing one of our snow campaign videos. And again, if you check out that YouTube playlist, you can watch some of these videos. In addition to snow videos, uh, we've also made videos and pushed for better regulations around bike share and scooters uh, as blocking the sidewalk access. And we're working on one currently right now around street cafes and the importance of maintaining the pedestrian right away. Again, check those out on the playlist. But frankly, it's not enough to have accessible pedestrian signals across your eight lane suburban, suburban highway, or like I heard Bellevue is building, uh, rain shelters at intersections for pedestrians because the signal length, the amount of time pedestrians have to wait to cross the street is so long because of their multi-lane highway like streets um, that have maximized car, uh, are maximized for car throughput. We have to address the ways car dependence is actively causing health disparities, over-policing, isolation, and contributing to the climate crisis. This photo is an intersection of one of the major north-south roads here in Seattle, Rainier, uh, with the Highway 90 on-ramps. I'm going to play a video of what this looks like, or did, recently. Uh, so as you can see, there are no crosswalks. Um, cars are traveling at high speeds and often are not yielding to people trying to cross north-south along Rainier. We did a couple of visits here uh, where we brought together disabled folks, local business people, pedestrian advocates, and representatives from our city and state transit agencies. And through this advocacy, oops, uh, we won some short-term improvements. Uh, we are, they, are, they have striped the crosswalks, installed flexible posts to narrow the lanes so cars are traveling um, less quickly and are forced to slow down a little bit, rumble strips, and new signage to warn drivers to slow as they exit the freeway. This is a diagram of some of those improvements at, at one of the, uh, the ramps. But really, this is going to take a lot more money and work to make this a safe place for pedestrians. This is the future site of the Judkin Park's light rail stop. So pedestrian use of this area will increase when it opens in 2023. 
not soon. Uh, what we actually need is to tee off this intersection so we can install a light that requires cars to stop as they merge onto Rainier. We were hoping pre-COVID uh, to ask for this in the legislature in, the legislature in January, um, but now with the budget crisis, this is on hold. How many freeways like this are creating barriers across our state, across our country, for people who don't have access to cars? And it goes back to that first question, whose mobility is important? Whose is deemed worth building infrastructure for? And whose is not? Whose needs can actively be ignored? High-speed roads not only create physical barriers for people who live in nearby communities, they also make people who live and work near them sick. We know that people who live along busy roads have higher rates of asthma, heart disease, and childhood cancer. Back when cars started to be mass produced and our cities became suddenly congested, our elected leaders thought that they just had, just as the delivery of sewer, water, and electricity was improved by hiring engineers to create more efficient systems, the same could occur with traffic. We live with that legacy today. Transportation planners base almost everything about efficiency, vehicle throughput, trying to get as many vehicles as possible to move through an area as quickly as possible. When we create more efficient systems, who is that effic efficiency benefiting and who is it hurting? Car crashes kill someone on average every 16 hours in our state. We know that BIPOC, disabled, and elder elderly people and people living in rural areas and on tribal lands face greater risks of being killed in traffic collisions. And who is not even being counted? This is an image of the bike of Elaine Hertzberg. Uh, she was the woman killed by the self-driving Uber in Arizona. She was walking her bike across the street and had grocery bags on her handlebars. The car didn't recognize her as a person and didn't attempt to brake. Can our quote unquote smart computer vision systems detect people with mobility aids, different skin colors, different movement patterns? This is a headline of a news article that talked about how autonomous vehicle algorithms don't reliably recognize people with darker skin tones. We've seen this over and over again with computer vision. Or do we require that people be tracked to be seen? Must you have an app installed and have a data plan? Who can move through our cities and whose movement are we prioritizing and facilitating? Whose movement is illegal? This is not just a science fiction conjecture. We have quote unquote intelligent traffic signals on Mercer here in Seattle that use Wi-Fi signals from car phones to detect how many cars are waiting at the light and adjust timings accordingly. The last I heard, they hadn't figured out a way to auto automatically detect pedestrians or people on bikes. Although at one point the city was suggesting that they would create an app that cyclists could download and run while they rode so that the city could see them so that they could have the lights change. Which begs the question, why can't we have our traffic lights on timers? Why do they need to be quote unquote smart? The answer is efficiency. Seattle wants to move more cars more quickly on Mercer. Never mind that the less traffic there is, the more you induce demand for more people to drive, resulting in more cars in our congested areas. We have to have surveillance because we want cars to go fast. And this is true beyond quote unquote smart city technology. We created modern policing because we subsidized the creation of car based transportation systems that require its users to be policed because the death and injury that can be caused by car collisions. I can't recommend enough the book of Policing the Open Road by Sarah Seo. I'm gonna read you guys a quote. Quote, 19th century enforcement tools proved disastrously inadequate in the anonymous, fast, and crowded world of automobility. In the search for solutions to the death and mayhem wrought by mass-produced cars, officials everywhere grappled with a fundamental puzzle. Why did law-abiding citizens disobey traffic laws?" End quote. If you don't have a chance to read her full book, there's also great interviews with uh, Professor Theo on 99% Invisible and war the War on Car podcasts. If you want an easier entry point, I, I highly recommend checking out her work. She talks in depth about how our modern police forces were created because of the real physical dangers presented by callers traveling at high speeds and how discretionary policing, the racialized discriminatory policing we see today, was created to allow white, wealthy, powerful citizens caught violating traffic laws to get off the hook. What if we valued other metrics over speed? For example, accessibility. Can everyone in your community get to essential services? This is a photo of Dixon who uses a power wheelchair 
and takes issue with Seattle's broken sidewalks. For disabled folks like myself, much travel was already burdensome. Not just for people like me without access to cars, but people in power wheelchairs who have their very expensive and hard to replace wheelchairs broken almost every time they have to check them on a commercial flight. Or people with chronic health disabilities who can't take the risk of exposure to crowd. Uh, the acceptance of work from home, Zoom public meetings, online webinars replacing conferences like this, uh, remote higher ed, these have been what many in the disability community have been advocating for, for ages. But while work from home and remote access might work for some, we also have to remember that there are many people who have jobs that can't be done from home. And there are many of us who are transit reliant and are at risk of losing access to public transit as a choice riders abandon the system and revenue plummets and routes are cut. But these changes in travel patterns during the pandemic can allow us to think seriously about what a just recovery would look like. So much of the costs of car design communities are externalized. The brunt is borne by poor black, brown, immigrant and disabled people who breathe polluted air living next to highways, who are over-policed, who are disproportionately killed in crashes, who don't have central air to escape smoke from wildfires that are increasing due to climate change. Transportation emissions are 44.6 of our greenhouse gas emissions here in Washington state more than half of which come from gas-powered cars. We know from a climate perspective that switching to electric vehicles is not enough. We have to reduce the vehicle miles traveled, that is, how much we drive every day. Those of us who can't drive or don't have access to cars have figured out ways to survive without a lot of car travel. And we believe that we share this live, that if we share this lived knowledge together, we can help all of us take steps to build more sustainable, resilient, equitable, and accessible communities. For example, what would it take to have essential services back in our communities within walking or rolling distance? How would that increase access and build deeper community connections? Connections that we know are critical to the resiliency as our communities face unprecedented severe weather events. This is a photo of what used to be the hardware store in Griffin, Indiana. This is the town where my dad grew up. Uh, when he was a kid in the 50s, there was a grocery store, a gas station, a hardware store, a cafe, and a K-12 school. Now there's only a cafe, barely. What happened? The interstate highway system. Griffin is right off Highway 64. It used to be only accessed by farm roads, now you can drive to Evansville in 40 minutes going 60 miles per hour instead of crawling along gravel. I'm sure we can all think of community owned businesses that have been displaced by speedy transportation that has made traveling further to shop elsewhere more attractive. What would it look like to rebuild our communities and our transportation infrastructure in a way that prioritized accessibility and equity over efficiency and speed? that prioritized essential services in every neighborhood and walkable, roll, rollable infrastructure to get there. This is an image of the railroads in Washington in the 1950s. It's pretty extensive. Um, those of you who have walked or rolled or ridden a rail to rail network in our state may have had the opportunity to enjoy some of these in, in a different form. I just got back from that uh, riding part of the Cascades to Palouse last weekend and I'm, I'm still a little tired from it. Um, last spring, I moved some old rail ties in our backyard and I was excited to flip over one of the ties and find the holes from the railroad spikes and the indentations from the tracks still intact. It's a good reminder that just as we transformed our cities, our land use and our lives around individual car ownership in the last hundred years, we have the same opportunity for radical transformation in the next 100. And we have the opportunity to do so in a way that values an access and equity over speed. So uh, here is my contact information. If you ever want to be in touch, um, you can reach me. I'm on Twitter quite a bit and there's my email. And then I've also pasted here again the YouTube playlist, which I highly recommend you check out. Um, it may introduce you to some new concepts and uh, just open your eyes and your ears to, to stories and voices that you haven't heard before. So I'm going to, let's see, stop sharing and take some questions. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Anna. It's really incredible to hear you speak and see all of the work that you do. Um, everyone, feel free as we go through these initial questions to keep adding your questions in the chat. Um, but I'd like to start off with a question around your approach to organizing. It's really incredible to see the way that you utilize video and social media to share people's stories. And I'm wondering what other tools you use, what tools you would recommend to other folks who are doing this work as well, and what challenges you see in the current organizing model. So kind of a lot of questions in one. Yeah, <laughs> theory of change around organizing. <laughs> yeah, this is something I thought, I thought about and think about a lot. I think to, to help um, understand where I am now, it, it helps to sort of think about where, where I learn from. And that I started out my career in the labor movement. So a lot of workplace-based organizing or industry-based organizing. And then I moved to the ACLU where I worked for the LGBT uh, and AIDS uh, project at the National ACLU for a couple of years, right around 2008, 9, 10, um, when a lot of things were shifting really dramatically um, in, in, in that landscape, um, which was a really exciting place to be. And the leadership there um, had, a, had this, this theory of change that was, well, you need to go out and find the right stories to help win hearts and minds. And so we would spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, we want to help um, Arkansas pass a, a law to allow gay couples to adopt children. Um, what kinds of couples should we be looking for as we go out to try to think about who to feature in videos? Uh, and sometimes it would be what kind of couple or what kind of stories would we want to meet certain, um, certain requirements to bring a legal case, but more often we are thinking about what, what would really win people over, people who might not necessarily have been supportive of gay rights. And so um, I actually came out to Washington State with them and did some work here around the Domestic Partnership Initiative. And I remember we were looking not only for gay couples for that, we were looking for older straight couples or other couples who you know, couldn't get married um, because they didn't want their benefits um, to be reduced and combined, um, but you know, want, were, were committed to each other and wanted to be there for each other in the hospital. And so I uh, got to drive around Washington and actually go up um, way up in the north, northeast part of the state to interview some, from a couple of rural couple who were straight who really wanted the domestic partnership law to pass. And it was, it was that sort of like, it wasn't you know, a part of the state where you would expect to hear um, pro-gay voices, right? And, and yet here they were um, very supportive. And so I think there's a, you know, finding, finding the stories that move people is important. Um, and I also think that it's important to recognize as you're doing that, that the stories that you may be identifying uh, may, wh who, whose stories you're not telling when you do that? Like, what are the stories that would turn people off? And, and how are you just sort of feeding into stereotypes um, as you do that work? So if you want to talk about, you know, transit dependent people, are you talking about homeless folks or are you, are you not talking about homeless folks? Because you know if you talk about homelessness, it's going to um, be a bit more of a lightning rod than, than if you were to talk about, you know, someone like me who's a, a you know, middle class white mom who is transit dependent. Um, so I think that that's part of it. I think the other part I, I love about using video for storytelling um, or asking people to share their stories um, for organizing is that when, um, when someone's asked to share their story, it, it sort of brings them into the issue and into, the, I mean, they, it's an issue they care about, but it, it makes them feel empowered, like they have a role in, in making the change happen. And so I've seen it, and this goes back to the labor work I did and, and doing storytelling for, for organizing campaigns is once you've asked someone to share their story, they are, they are, they are committed. Like they are in, in the work with you um, because they are part of it and they see themselves in it. And so I, I think even if you don't share those stories externally or have a plan for doing that, just asking people to share their own stories and their own experience can be a really powerful way to, um, to bring people into, into a shared vision and a shared campaign. That was a lot. <laughs> and I'm not sure I answered it completely, but yeah. No, that's great. I, I have sort of a piggyback question off of that. We'll hop into some more questions after that. But as an organizer, this work has changed so drastically as a result of COVID-19 and the lockdowns and quarantine. And I'm wondering how 
you and your team have responded to those changes. I noticed that it, in the beginning in that video of the Duwamish Longhouse crossing, folks were wearing masks, things like that. But I'm wondering how that shows up in your organizing and in the, the content that you put together. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm still wrapping my head around what this looks like. I had back in March planned a big statewide tour using public transit um, to highlight the need to, for you know, census work. Um, because a lot of, I figured a lot of hard to reach populations or quote unquote hard to reach populations would be overlap with people who are riding transit through um, more rural parts of the state. And that, you know, that was supposed to happen in March <laughs> and that didn't happen. And we're still, you know, not out there in gatherings talking to people the way that you know the way that i know how to organize and so it has to be more online um which in some ways you know in some places has benefits right because it, it allows people who aren't necessarily able to attend a public meeting to to you know contribute and share their voices and i think for for um for public meetings it's actually great to have these online options but um, when you're trying to reach populations that don't necessarily have data plans or, you know, aren't on the same platforms that, um, that, that you are, it's, it's a challenge. And I think we are going to come out of this um, with, you know, some people being way more connected and other people being left out of that entirely. I think a little bit about, I did work for the ACLU uh, helping identify plaintiffs for voter ID cases in Kansas where you were required to have a, a photo ID and be able to be able to vote. And, you know, I think many people are like, well, doesn't everyone have a photo ID? And the answer is no. But the people who don't have photo IDs are the people who are, you know, not super connected to services, not online, not going to be on Facebook necessarily answering your ads. And so, um, you have to go out, you know, where, where those people gather and, and, you know, and interact in person. And that's the kind of work that I'm missing doing right now. Same. I feel the same way. <laughs> um, we have a question here about street lighting saying, I've noticed that street lighting is ubiquitous and lighting for sidewalks and trails is often minimal or missing altogether. It seems weird that people don't have lights like cars do is your organization pushing for better lighting and also how can cascade and washington bikes and other organizations like ours be helping in that work yeah it's not one of our active campaigns right now but it was definitely something when i first moved back to washington from new york city where you know there's a lot more pedestrians in new york city and i think lighting is therefore designed to for for sidewalks coming back to Seattle and being in my neighborhood and being so frustrated that there'd be street lights, but nothing, like absolutely nothing as far as sidewalk lighting. And I know Seattle technically has a sidewalk lighting plan, but um, you don't really see that, at least not in, in Rainier Valley. Um, and that's frustrating. And I, you know, again, it comes down to priorities. We were, I was driving back on I-5 with my, um, my partner yesterday, the day before, and we were in the, in the dark and we were driving through Tacoma and, all of a sudden there's all this new you know highway work there that's been well, going on forever but the amount of street lighting <laughs> is just obscene there's so much lighting um and i, I really think it, it does sort of perfectly illustrate you know who uh whose transportation and mobility needs were prioritizing totally another question sort of related to priorities is what do you think we should be pushing for in the legislature in the next few years? What are things that could really make a big impact and a big difference in the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I am still wrapping my head around what is happening in, in the transportation package, which is up for renewal this year. Um, right now, because of I-976 and because of the pandemic and, and crisis there, funding for the multimodal account, which covers public transit, which covers basically everything that isn't highways, is, is really, really shaky. And so um, figuring out how we fund that, and it can't be through the gas tax, um, because that's restricted to highway spending, I think is, is, is tricky, right? We need to figure out new revenue sources and you know they they need to be progressive revenue sources. They shouldn't be revenue you know taxes that fall on the people who can least afford to pay it. And then you know the other hope is that they're they're sustainable, that they're green revenue sources, that they um, you know uh, are a way for us to move away from um, 
from carbon. And so how do you balance that with, with the, the progressive, the need to have them be progressive, and then the need to actually have it happen politically? I think those are big, complicated questions um, that I don't have all the answers to. But I think there's going to be, there is a coalition of folks working on this. We're part of the Climate Alliance um, that's, you know, with a whole bunch of different organizations, labor groups, uh, environmental groups, community groups, us, um, trying to figure out what we can push for together that could reasonably pass um, because the status quo not only is, is, you know, failing us in the way that it's failed us forever, but it's failing even more dramatically this year and we will see really severe uh, cuts to all the programs that we rely on, um, you know, everything outside of highways, realistically, if we don't come up with a new plan. Sort of related to that, but more just a broad question is, what's something that you wish that folks who are elected officials or folks in power as engineers or planners could better understand about mobility justice and the future of the priorities that you are working towards and the things that you see as being so crucial in community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's, you know, I, I want people to experience what it's like to travel um, in different ways. And I think, um, you know, asking people to, to try to get around their community for a day or a week without access to car, a car would be a really powerful way to pe for people, for our electeds to understand <laughs> what the transportation system is like for people, um, you know, without the privilege of car ownership. Um, so that, was, that would be something I, I, I would challenge any elected official to do. And to document, I, I think, you know, my frustration a little bit with it, you know, I think transportation is often completely divorced from conversations around equity, conversations around climate, um, and conversations around accessibility. Um, there hasn't been a lot of work, at least um, so far in in recent years, uh, among disability groups in our state around transportation as a priority. I think, you know, you look at Green New Deal stuff and. There's not, aside from electric vehicles, um, not, not a huge emphasis on transportation access. And then, you know, how, how we connect transportation and public health conversations and, and the disparities, um, you know, there, as well as policing and over-policing. I just think we need elected leaders to see those connections um, and be able to, to, to tackle them together. Um, because I think when you sort of break these these pieces off individually, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't solve the larger and deeper issues. I have another sort of high level question, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty. But okay. what would be the first couple of actions that you would take to increase accessibility if you had a mandate to make those changes, and if the funding, the political, and the cultural resistance were pushed aside? If we're in a, an mm -hmm. ideal world. <laughs> Yeah, this is something I've actually been thinking of because I, I think, you know, we are in this moment where things are changing because of the pandemic. We've seen travel patterns shift really dramatically um, for, for, you know, your typical nine to five office worker commuter. And that has opened up the window to have conversations around what is the system we want to build because the system we have right now has disintegrated and then all the funding mechanisms we had sort of based on that system have fallen apart. So what system do we build? And for me, it comes back to, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we do need to fund public transit. We need to make sure we have a robust public transit system. I also really profoundly think we need communities that have walkable, rollable infrastructure and have affordable essential services um, in them. And so, you know, it, it's part of it's about building housing in areas that are already dense and have those services. But I think another part of it is, is building the services in the communities that exist now. Uh, what would it mean, you know, to have a community center or a coffee shop in, in smaller rural communities that don't have that? Um, or communities like Skyway that don't have that? Like, what, what would it, you know, I think that's where we need to, to think about um, how can we all reduce the amount we travel? Um, and to do that, I think we need things located closer to where we are. And that's not something that's impossible. That's something that we had before. Um, but we've, you know, it, it was with, you know, sort of all the costs of cheap cars being uh, borne by other people or borne by future generations. Um, we, we created a system that, that moved away from that. And I think it's time to move back. 
Great. Um, well, we have a question here. You made a great point about how we have organized transportation away from small towns and towards larger cities. So in addition to overlooking the needs of people who can't participate in that kind of long distance trip making, is there, an, there seems to be an economic story there that is compelling. Do you see a way back? And do you know of any models where that has worked? Mm, yeah, <laughs> I don't. I mean, I don't, I, this is something that I'm just starting to think about more. And I would love if folks who have read more about this and want to you know, respond in, in the comments and share. Um, I'd be curious, you know, Strong Towns is uh, somewhere, some folks have written a lot about this, um, but I, I haven't, yeah, I haven't dug in there super deep. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think there is also this moment too, or you have to think about what does it mean with, rather than going to a store to have, you know, to buy something, that thing is instead getting delivered to your home. Um, and that, you know, that works to a certain extent, but what if we were, instead of, you know, having all this last mile delivery, put vehicles um, on our streets, we had community hubs where you could go and pick up your things, the hubs that were within walkable, rollable distance from your home, uh, hubs that, you know, would allow people to come together and, you know, post, post pandemic, interact with their neighbors. Um, because I do think, that uh, connection to the people you live with and around is really important and is something that gets lost when we move online and you know you're connecting with people who aren't necessarily the people who are living in your community. And so this question kind of goes back to something you touched on earlier of how you prioritize your work but given just the huge amount of need and the huge amount of disinvestment how do you prioritize your work? How do you choose what issues you work on and what does that process look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's something we're still figuring out. Um, as Disability Rights Washington, we do community surveys, right? And then through those surveys, um, we figure out what community needs are and then, you know, that is discussed um, through our board. Um, but you know the specifics specifics of that <laughs> uh you know it gets a lot more complicated the way i like to think about it is you know what what where are there not other groups already doing the work um you know so for example in the seattle area there's a lot of organizing around transit and transit users and that's awesome um and and there's some places where perhaps you know disabled transit users voices could be amplified but but that work is happening there's other places in the state where there just isn't the funding yet or the infrastructure, and so how can we support and build up um, in places where there, there isn't robust organizing happening already? So this is another sort of nitty gritty question, is you've spoken to the issues with autonomous vehicles and automated controls in relation to mobility equity. I'm wondering if you can see there being a potential positive relationship between AV and safe, equitable mobility, or are the two just not destined to work together? Yeah, you know, I mean, there, you hear there are there are arguments that you know autonomous driving is safer because you know it's not distracted, it's um, you know it doesn't have it can't fail in the ways that human drivers fail. But I think there are still so many gaps in what what that intelligent driving um, machine learning can do and can do accurately and you know what we see so far isn't 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 great uh, the fact that you know that that people with different skin tones aren't detected um, I really you know with what we saw with the uber crash um, you know they conject that she the car decided not to break because they thought you know the plastic bags were just plastic bags floating down the street and I don't know, I'm someone who's definitely carried groceries home from the grocery store on my bike a million times with plastic eggs dangling off my handlebars. And that really sort of profoundly bothered me that, you know, the algorithm and the people designing that never thought that would be, you know, a, a thing that they would encounter a bike with plastic bags on the handlebars on the street. Like it just, it, it wasn't. And, and so all the, you know, multitude of ways that we move and we are and we look, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it can get there. Um, so that's that's my concern. And then also just who is you know who is who is actually going to benefit from it? 
Um, you know, there are compelling arguments that, okay, sure, it could benefit people like me who can't drive, but I, you know, would it be affordable to me? Would it be affordable to, you know, the disability community is generally pretty poor. Um, and so uh, to, to assume that people are going to be able to afford this technology, even if it does meet our accessibility needs, I think is a big question. Um, and then, you know, what, what are the impacts on vehicle mile traveled? How does having, um, you know, if, if you suddenly don't need to pay attention when you drive, are you willing to have a much longer commute? And does that increase, you know, the environmental and public health um, negative externalities of, of you know, if, if you suddenly have all these autonomous vehicles and people living even further away from where they need to go um, because, because the commuting has become easier. Um, so I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not holding my breath. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the way we have seen Uber and, and Lyft and, and ride hailing roll out in our communities, I don't think it's going to look drastically different from that. And all the problems with equity and with access that we see there, I think are going to be amplified again, um, unless things change radically. Um, you know, will, will there be wheelchair accessible vehicles? Will people with kids and car seats be able to ride? Like so many questions about um, access to the vehicles even, so yeah. Well, this is a question, sort of a logistical question of, do you have a list or an inventory of disability advocacy groups in Washington state? And if not, do you know where folks could get their hands on that kind of information? Hmm, I don't have a list. I think it would depend, you know, if, if the um, person has a specific uh, need or group they're looking to connect with, I'm happy to, to communicate with them offline. Um, but I don't know the list. And then we have a question here, sort of zooming back out again is, it seems like this efficiency mindset, this model that we use for planning is so deeply ingrained in the work that so many of us do. How can we get away from this mindset? How can we possibly move into this new framework um, unilaterally? Yeah, it's a hard one. I mean, I, I, I think those of us who've grown up in capitalism, to be frank, like we're always taught to, to work, you know, work smarter, work more. Um, and I think it wasn't until I became um, more involved with the disability community that I started to see the ways that that leaves people out and actually harms us. And so uh, I think reading about um, disability and disability uh, disability justice is a way to sort of wrap your head around it a little bit more outside of the transportation frame, um, but in the context of, of, you know, just what it means to, to not try to prioritize speed. Um, but yeah, it, it is a mindset that I think a lot of us are just, you know, it's, it's deep and, and it applies to more than just the transportation parts of our lives and um, will take unlearning. And back to your question from before, for the folks that want to take a look, DOH has a list of nonprofit disability organizations. Barb Chamberlain just dropped that into the chat if folks want to take a look. Um, but sort of on this moving away from an efficiency model, I guess my, my final question to you is, if you were to look down the road five, 10 years from now, what is the mobility community that you want to see? What, are you, what do you envision as the future of our mobility, active transportation community in Washington, but beyond as well? Mm. <laughs> I think, you know, this is something that, that uh, yeah, <laughs> it's important to visualize. I, I would like to see the ability of, of everyone to move around our communities, right? Without fear, without fear of harassment, um, without fear of police violence, um, without physical barriers, and in ways that are more environmentally and, and um, sustainable and also don't contribute to, to really negative public health outcomes with, with pollution, um, I think. 
we have to, you know, we have chosen to, to build this world around cars um, and to the point where it's so hard to imagine what our lives could look like without that kind of mobility. But I think it is possible. And I would like to see us starting to, to as, a, as a community, um, to, to really challenge ourselves to, to think about what a world um, could look like. How can we chip away at that, at that car dependence? Um, and, and think about how, what, what would a world like that look like? What would you need to not um, be so reliant on that vehicle? Um, to be part of your community so that we can create, you know, a place where more of us have access and, um, and can be included. And I guess my final, final question is for folks who are participating in this session or watching this recording, what advice do you have for them who would like to get involved with this work, who'd like to be a part of this future that you're envisioning? How can they take that first step into, into this field? Yeah, so our, our organizing right now is focusing on folks who are, you know, who are transit reliant, who don't have access to cars. And so if that is you, we want to hear from you. If that is not you and you want to be an ally to our work, I, I encourage you to follow us on Twitter. Um, you know, and, um, and I, I think it's also just, just to start to notice and think about the ways that you rely on, um, on cars and, and, and transportation system that leaves people out. And try to try to reduce that in your daily daily lives. What does it mean to to not um, to not drive as much? Awesome. Well, Anna, thank you so much for being here with us today. Really appreciate your time and your work. Um, feel free to shout out how people can get in contact with you, where they can find you, and the work that you do, uh, because it's really important in Seattle and Washington. Um, so thank you again and thank you everyone for being here with us. Um, our next session today will be at 4 p.m. It's age and active transportation. That'll be followed by a networking session, happy hour um, for folks at 5.30 and then we'll resume again tomorrow. But Anna, again, thank you so much and folks, there will be a feedback form that we'll be putting in the chat bar here. Your feedback is really crucial to us. Um, thank you again for providing that. It'll also be included in an email that you'll get at the end of today. But hope to see all of you at four o'clock. And again, thanks to our attendees. Thanks to Anna and have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you.